Good evening, church. If you would just stand up to your feet. The altars are open. We're gonna go into the time of worship, right? Come on, let me see your hand.
together Strangers neighbors Our blood is one Children A generation Of every nation The kingdom come So don't let your heart be you head up, I don't feel evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is mighty in love with you. So take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember what I have come for us. Let the praise go. 
His kingdom come. We sing it, Jesus, our redemption, our salvation is in His blood. Jesus, light of heaven, friend forever, His kingdom. Excited to be here, church. It's going to be an amazing night. We're excited that you're here with us. As you return to your seats, shake a hand, get to know somebody that's around you tonight. this part of our service because it's like watching one big family get to connect with the relatives you haven't seen since this morning, right? <laughs> well, welcome to Live Church. If this is your first time or your first time in a long time, we want to say welcome and thank you for being here. We know there's lots of other places and lots of other things that you could be doing on a Sunday evening, but we consider it an honor that you're here and we'd love to be able to connect with you and answer any questions that you might have about your experience with us. So one of the ways you can help us do that is there's a card in the seat back in front of you. If you'll fill it out, give us as much information on that as you feel comfortable, and then drop it in the offering as it comes by in a moment, or take it out the doors to my right, to your left, and you can exchange that card for a gift of appreciation and a free voucher to our cafe for Sunday mornings. So church family, let's welcome our guests. All right, now... Men, how many in here have signed up for the men's conference yet? The rest of you have no excuse from this moment forward. Take out your phones right now. Text MEN, M-E-N, in case you were confused, to 31996. You're going to get a link to register in the text message that comes back to you. Click that link tonight, tomorrow, whenever. Register, sign up for it. It's an evening and a weekend that you're not going to want to miss. So we encourage you to do that. Take that link. Send it to all your friends, your contact list. Tell them that you're paying for their registration or not. It was a joke, too, but you laughed at the first one, not the second one. So I got one out of two. So that's I'm happy with that. Um, and then uh, next weekend, we have the Watoto Children's Choir here Sunday evening. Are you excited? It is going to be an a, 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 a night not to miss. So we encourage you to be out here with us. Uh, we have had an amazing morning and an amazing day so far. If you weren't here with us this morning, it was heart for the house. It is probably by far, this is my favorite weekend here at Life Church because in a one day time frame, we get to look at in excitement of what God's going to do in 2019 through our Heart for the House initiatives. But we also tonight get to celebrate all that God did last year through our business meeting when we're done. So we get to look in anticipation and be reminded at the same time. And so it's an amazing opportunity. If you've not turned in your faith promise cards, you're, you're either sitting on them or they're sitting next to you. So we encourage you to take them out, fill it out. The, it's the first Sunday of the month, so it's a missions offering as well. And there's another part to that. We're asking you to, in faith, extend a hand in giving. But part of that giving a hand in giving is also putting foot to action. So tonight, before you leave, see Felipe by Next Steps. He's got a table set up with all the local and foreign missions projects that Life Church will be engaging in. We encourage you to be involved as the feet of Christ in our community. Amen? All right, so as we get ready to continue tonight in giving of our tithes and our love offerings, um, my wife and I have attempted to be extremely intentional with our daughter. Uh, we, we believe wholeheartedly your language locates you. 
And so, uh, for example, on, on Sunday mornings, Natalie goes in to, to the church extremely early in the morning and I stay behind to wake up Evelyn. It's part of our routine and I'll go in there and I'll wake her up and I'll say something to the effect of, hey, Evelyn, Bubba, it's, it, it's time to get up. We get to go to church. We get to go see our friends. We get to go worship Jesus. We get to go uh, see see grandma. We get to go see uh, auntie. We get to, we get to, we get to, we get to, we get to. I never want my daughter to think for a moment that we have to. I don't want her to go, well, we have to go to church. It's daddy's job. We get to go and do something. We get to go be a part of something. And I wonder sometimes for me, how do I approach giving in my language? Is it something I have to do? I have to give 10% because that's what scripture says. If I give nine and a half, I'm somehow a less Christian, but I'm sure not giving 10 and a quarter percent because I'm only required to give 10% because that's what, do we look at it as we have to give or do we look at it, we get to give. We get to be a part of something. We get to link arms with God. We get to be salt and light in our community. We get to be part of a house, as you will see tonight in the business meeting, that is invested in reaching the local and the communities beyond Wesley Chapel. So tonight as we get ready to give, I encourage you to be a little introspective. How does your language locate you when it comes to giving? And let God speak to you and follow his promptings tonight. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today and we thank you for the opportunity we have to give. We ask that you take our gifts to bring others into a right relationship with you. In your name we pray. Amen. To me, you know, we were thinking, oh, poor guy, you know, his face is disfigured. And most people would say, nobody's going to love me. And here he is engaged and, you know, to a wonderful girl. And so, you know, who knows? Maybe that scar is what got him where he is today. think that when you serve together you know it won't build you up together when you serve together sometimes one person is running a different point than another and sometimes when you serve together you might even be doing different tasks but the whole point is that you're serving for God and so when you're serving for God you're edifying your relationship together through God so when we serve together we kind of have different areas where one of us is more in charge than the other at the community center, he definitely tends to do things more than I would. And then when we work with kids, I tend to do things more than he would. That's how we figured where our strengths are, and we would rather support the other than see who would lead necessarily. And so I think we've learned to communicate over the years on who will take point in which aspect of serving. See, I love missions, and he's known that since we've met each other and he's wanted to go for a very long time. So we did a lot of very intense fundraising together. And when we talked about the decision to go on this missions trip, it was, you know, how do you think people will be able to see us separately? So when we went on the trip, we had a lot of fun. There were definitely times where we could hang out together and stuff like that, but we each also understood that there were times when we needed to go do our own separate thing. And so it was really cool because, you know, sometimes when you see couples on a trip, they're attached at the hip. You know, they don't want to separate because it's their comfort zone. And it was really awesome to see that he was willing to separate from me so we could each enjoy the trip in our own ways as well. I haven't met a lot of the people on the team, but after this week, only the few, few days we've been together, I feel like we've all grown closer together and more as a family. Yes. And that is another great experience because in my past, I really don't have great experiences with family. But I'm glad I made one here. 
So for me, this has become my family. This has become an extension of my family. And it's really important to me that I have this as my foundation. And it's really been awesome to see as I've gotten older and I've learned more biblical uh, foundations that this is such a steady church. Because when you study the Bible more, when you see things, you begin to understand more of what people are telling you. Because you're not being spoon fed, you're actually learning for yourself. And so when you hear the pastor preach and when you hear him, which guest speakers he brings in, you, you can hear what they're saying. You know that what they're saying is appropriate to the Bible. You know what they're saying is for a firm foundation of God. And to me, that is really crucial because the day that something like that changes is the day that you lose the church. Man, that was the third and the final video uh, that we used this morning in our Heart for the House message. If you were not able to be with us in service this morning, you can go on our website and you can go ahead and click on and you can watch the entire service this morning. It'll include the praise and worship. It'll include everything. So we encourage you to do that. It was really an exciting morning. Got some really positive feedback uh, as a result of the challenge that we laid to our congregation this morning. Have you ever been in a conversation uh, with someone and uh, their response to about another person, about another situation was, oh, they have trust issues? You know what I'm talking about? That, 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 that phrase, they have trust issues. What it indicates is they, they have a, a difficulty in demonstrating trust. I want to talk about that tonight. I want to talk about trusting God in troubled times. Solomon, who is considered by many people to be the, most, the wisest man that ever lived, gave us these words of, of insight, I guess the best way to put it. He says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9, uh, excuse me, verse, uh, verse five, trust in the Lord with all your heart. You probably know these verses as well as I do. And lean not to your own understanding in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Now his father, David gives us some very similar insight in, uh, chapter 37 of the book of Psalms. And you'll find in a moment that the apple doesn't fall very far from the tree. Okay. He says in Psalms chapter 37, verse three, David says, trust in the Lord and do good, dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. And then in verse seven, he says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. And then in verse 39, continuing in that same chapter, but the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. Now let that soak in for just a moment. He is our strength in time of trouble. And then he goes on and says this, and the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them. Here's the reason why. Because they trust in him. The Isaiah, the, the prophet wrote these words. He said, thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. And then he says, because he trusts in thee. Trust is an issue for us that we need to properly address because we will all face troubled times in our personal lives. And so it really does require us, it sets forth the necessity to cultivate, to nurture trust in God. At the end of the day, regardless of your age, young, old, or in between, regardless of your age, regardless of your season of life, we will all face things like disappointment, Things don't go the way we want. Disillusionment, things don't go the way we want. Uh, discouragement, things didn't go the way we want. We didn't get this outcome. We thought we were gonna get that outcome, okay? We will all face things like uncertainty. We're not sure which way it's gonna, which way that thing's gonna fall. We're, we aren't gonna face fear and we're gonna face frustration. On one hand, we may be falling, our life may be falling apart because of wrong decisions that we have made or perhaps even though through no fault of our own, we experience upheaval. And we need to realize that at the end of the day, it rains on the just and the unjust. We, we just have to realize that we live in a really messed up society, culture, and world. Now, during these times of uncertainty, during times of fear and frustration, during times of discouragement, disillusionment, disappointment, what do we need to do? Here's the answer. We need to cultivate. We need to nurture a greater trust in God. We need to nurture it. We need to culture, cultivate it. We need to protect it. 
Now, I want you to turn with me, if you have a Bible, to Genesis chapter 28 for just a few moments where we're going to pull some principles out of the passage. It's the story of, of Jacob when he's, at, when he's at Bethel, and he has this dream, and there's a ladder. He has an open heaven. There's a dream. He sees angels coming down and going back up, and God meets with him. He has an encounter with God when he is there. And I'm going to start, honestly, with, um, with verse 13. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said to him, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad, west and east, to the north and south, and in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. I don't know if you caught that, but that same promise was made to his grandfather, Abraham, in chapter 12. Now, let me continue reading here in verse, um, verse 15. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. At this very moment in his life, Jacob is facing some uncertain times. He's facing an uncertain future, and maybe you can relate. Maybe you're not sure what tomorrow, the day after, the day after that, really hold for you. But there are four quick principles that I want to glean from verses 13, 14, and 15. The first one is this. If you want to take notes, I think these are four things that you can kind of anchor and put your teeth into. The first thing is this. In order to cultivate and nurture trust uh, in times of difficulty, in times of uncertainty, troubled times, the first thing we need to do is we need to remember God's promises. Remember his promises. It says in, in uh, Genesis chapter 28, verse 13 and 14, and behold, the Lord God stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac, and the land on which you lie, I will, as a promise, I will give to you and to your descendants. Then he addresses the descendants with, again, an additional promise. And also, your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. That means you can't count it all. You shall spread abroad to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south, and in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In that moment, the first thing God does is God reminds Jacob of, of promises that he made in the past. Remember now, same promises were made to his grandfather Abraham. Remember Genesis chapter 12. I will bless you and all the families of the earth will be blessed <clears throat> through you. Can I have some water, please? He basically says, I made a promise to your grandfather Abraham and I made a promise to your father, Isaac. And I'm simply rehearsing that same promise with you. I'm reminding you of the promise I made to them. So God is saying, these are the promises. Now, I need you to reflect on them, and I need you to, to remember them. He's saying, the very land that you're sleeping on, uh, I'm going to bless you, and you're going to live here, and your descendants are going to live here, and you're going to be a blessing to the entire earth. This principle is not only true for Jacob, but I believe that we need to remember the promises of God for our own lives. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles, or 2 Corinthians, rather, 120, that all the promises of God in Christ are yes and Amen. Yes and amen. Okay, so when we're facing difficulty, when we're living in troubled times, what we need to do is open up our Bibles and focus on God's word and on God's promises. I say this often when I talk about trust in the Bible. I grew up singing this cute little Sunday school kids church song, every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. My pastor that I sat under and, and served under in Fort Lauderdale used to say this, your future is as bright as the promises of God. Amen? All right, now, in some regards, it's a choice. <clears throat> Excuse me, let me clear my throat while I'll give you time to let that settle in. Trusting God is a choice. You made a choice to trust the chair. All right? You sat down on the chair because you demonstrated trust 
in the chair. Now we can pace back and forth and worry and focus on the problem, or we can choose to be strengthened. We can cultivate, nurture, protect our trust in God. How? By focusing on the promises that God has made to us in his word. Secondly, to cultivate trust uh, during difficult times, during troubled times. The second thing we need to remember is we need to remember God's presence. In verse 15, behold, I am with you. Now, he doesn't say I was with you. He said, I am with you. He doesn't say I will be with you. He says, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. We must know. Let me rephrase that and restate that. We must know that God is with us. If we're to face the uncertain, fearful future that could potentially be down the road from us, we need to be able to face it with trust. We need to be able to face it with confidence. We need to be able to face it with courage. And the only way we can do that is by remembering that God is right there by our side. Obviously, Jacob needed to know this, so God reminded him of it in verse 15 that I just read to you. Jacob may have felt alone. But we never, never, never are really alone. It was an old hymn that I grew up singing, no, never alone, no, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. Jacob was never alone, and frankly, neither are we. Let me rehearse a few thoughts with you regarding that. Psalms chapter 23, verse 4, David said, Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And so David is letting us know that even though we're walking through the very valley of the shadow of death, there's no reason for us to be fearful because God is right by our side. In Joshua chapter 1, beginning at verse 5, uh, here's what we read. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Verse six, be strong and of good courage for to this people, you shall divide an inheritance, the land which I swore to your fathers to give them. Again, God's rehearsing a promise. Verse seven, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law, which Moses, my servant commanded you do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. Verse eight, this book of the law, the word, shall not depart from your mouth. You shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do uh, according to all that is written therein. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Have not I commanded you. Be strong and have a good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed. Here, I said all that. Say this. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. For Joshua and Israel, they were facing a season of uncertainty. And so God steps in and he reminds them, you're not alone. In Isaiah chapter 41 and verse 10, the prophet writes, on behalf of God, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. He is addressing a season of difficulty. And so God is saying, there's no need to be afraid. There's no need to be dismayed. I'm present. I'm with you. I'm going to help you. And then when we're facing those troubled times that I'm trying to help us understand, it says in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Although the rivers and through the rivers, rather, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, they sh you shall not be burned, neither shall the flame scorch you. Again, we're being reminded of the presence of God. Now, let me step back, take a deeper breath, and slow this down. Jesus says to his disciples in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, we know this to be the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to observe all the commandments that I have given to you baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And lo, I am with you always. Would you shout always? always. Answer the question, what does always mean? Always. always. There's never going to be a moment, Jesus said, that you're going to walk this earth in the natural arena that I will leave you. He said, I will be with you 
always, even to the end of the age. So what is Jesus saying? If we're still alive when he comes back, he will still be with us in the spirit realm. All right, And then we're told in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 5 and 6, classic passage of Scripture, where it simply says, uh, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, this does not mean that we will escape the storms of life, the trials of life, the problems of life, the troubled times of life, but we know that we can face them with the sure and certain knowledge that he is present with us. Thirdly, to cultivate trust in God during times of difficulty, uncertain times, troubled times, we need to remember God's protection. It's God's protection we need to be reminded of now. It says in Genesis chapter 28, verse 15, behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go. God's protection is the very next thing he reminded, he reminded, uh, reminded Jacob of, and he's reminding us of. He's saying, I am with you and I will keep you. The word keep in the Hebrew language, as well as in the Hebrew culture, carries the meaning of protect, to protect someone. And, and, and you see in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, I think it's chapter 58, God says, I, I will be your rear, rear guard. In other words, God's saying, I got your back. That's what God is saying. I've got your back. I've got your back. I'm going to be with you. And then in Psalms 91, he that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, and I will say of the Lord. And then there's this wonderful list of scriptures where God is simply reminding us that he is there to protect us. When you look at the, at the nation of Israel, they're facing the Red Sea, and Pharaoh is coming down behind them. they got a mountain on one side and a mountain on the other side. And what happens was the, this pillar of fire that was leading them lifted up stepped back and came behind them. So now rather than leading them, God is protecting them. Okay? Pharaoh and his 600,000 charioteers and, and henchmen could not get to the nation of Israel because God says, you ain't getting to my kids. I'm going to put a pillar of fire, a pillar of my presence right there. I don't think we really, really fully understand or realize just how often God has protected us in a situation. Because we don't see into the unseen realm. We don't see that God was right there and he just got his hand up to the enemy. Say, no, no weapon formed against them is going to prosper. That's their inheritance. I gave them. You're not. And so we need to remind ourselves that when we go through times of difficulty, God is there to protect us. Lastly, very quickly, in order to cultivate trust in God during the troubled times of life, we need to remember God's provision. Remember God's provision. He again says in verse 15, Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken. There was a bumper sticker. I was sitting out here at the traffic light um, one morning out by, by the 7-Eleven as it comes out onto um, 54 uh, Wesley Chapel Boulevard, I think they call it. And I was behind a red Corvette. It was a newer Corvette. I was behind this red Corvette. And there was a bumper sticker on the, the lower panel that said this, I'm not spoiled. I'm a well-kept woman. <laughs> well-kept woman. The promise in verse 15 is... He says he's going to keep you. That word keep has a dual meaning in the Hebrew language and in the Hebrew culture. It not only meant to protect, as I've already uh, covered, it also meant to provide for or to care for. So Jacob clearly understood this from his Hebrew culture, and he fully expected God to do both, protect him and provide for him. Yes, God's going to be his protector, but God is also going to be his provider. And somebody in the room needs to be reminded tonight that God will provide. You see, Jacob knew that God was going to provide his food and his clothing, his housing, his whatever. Now remind ourselves for just a moment. I know I'm just a little bit longer than I need to be right now, but I need to press this moment with you. 
here's the nation of Israel. They just came out of Egyptian bondage where they were fed every day by the Egyptians. They had the leeks and the onions. They sat around the garlic pots and all that meat pots and all that stuff, flesh pots. And they got their meals brought to them. Now they're out in the wilderness and they're thinking, hey, wait a minute, where are we going to get our food? Well, what does God do? God comes along and provides manna, quail, water, and clothing that didn't wear out. God made provision for them. Now, Paul, in some ways, in my opinion, affirmed this principle and this promise in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19. But my God shall supply, that's another way of saying make provision for, all your needs according to my riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Have you ever thought about that last phrase, according to his riches in glory? I don't know if you realize this or not, but God's resources are not able to be exhausted. Okay, at the end of the day, now let's be real, let's face it, each of us will face or be confronted with times of uncertainty, troubled times, even face fear regarding the future. But we can do so, as our text says, by putting our trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him. Invite him into the moment when you're making the decisions, and he will direct your paths. How do we do it, Ed? We cultivate a greater capacity to trust God as we purposefully, intentionally, strategically remember God's promises, remember God's presence, remember God's protection, and remember God's provision. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet because at this moment, we're going to transition into prayer for those in the room that perhaps are facing some measure of uncertainty or some measure of trouble in your life. I don't care if it's something small or something big, but I, I felt like that the Lord laid this on my heart because of some individuals that might be in the room with us tonight who are going through a time of trouble, and, and you just needed to be reminded to trust God in times of trouble. So if that's you and you want prayer, if you want someone to come up, put a hand on your shoulder, and agree with you in prayer, I need you to put your hand in the air right where you are right now. Amen. Hands going up. Keep them up for just a moment or two or three, okay? There's some individuals who have hands in the air. I'm going to ask some guys to get around the guys and girls to get around the girls. We're going to close out in prayer, corporate prayer. In just a moment, I'm going to lead you. Just go ahead and gather around them real quick. Got some guys over here. Got a girl in the middle right here. And I'm going to lead you in prayer. Now listen to what I'm about to say. Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. Jesus is the truth. He is the way, the truth, the life. Jesus is the truth. He can't lie. So no lies can come out of him. He's the embodiment, the personification, the very essence of truth. And so when he says, whatever you ask in my name, I'm going to do it. I step back, and what that does is it bolsters my confidence to pray in his name with assurance, certain confidence that he's going to do what we're asking him to do. So you that are being prayed for, you release your faith right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift up our voices and we cry out to you on behalf of these whose hands have been raised uh, in this room uh, tonight, that God, they're walking through a time of trouble. They're walking through a season of uncertainty. They are coming out of a moment of disappointment or disillusionment or discouragement. They're facing fear about the future, frustration, about their present. God, whatever it is that they are facing, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you will somehow, God, remind them of your promises, remind them of your presence, remind them of your protection, remind them of your provision for their lives so that they will have the ability to cultivate, nurture, and protect an even greater capacity, an even greater measure of trust in you in the days ahead as they walk through a time of trust. Father, we are asking it now in the name of Jesus with the confidence that you are able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we would ever ask or think or dream or imagine or, or expect and believe for according to your power that is at work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God.